Hello there, my name is Christopher Pryor and I'm a lecturer in Imperial History at the University of Leeds and I'm here today to discuss the popularity of imperialism. More to the point, I'd like to have a look at the question to what extent was imperialism a popular policy in Britain throughout the period from 1880 to 1902? I'm going to start firstly by outlining what some historians have said uh, already and then I'm going to go on to certain problems with these interpretations and how we might take a more considered approach and even criticise the question that's been set. Now, firstly, one of the most popular views is that the empire got more and more popular over this era. At the start of the period, you have William Gladstone coming to power as the Liberal Prime Minister in 1880, replacing the Conservative Benjamin Disraeli. Gladstone had come to power as a result of a mammoth election campaign throughout 1879 and 1880. He went round a huge number of places talking about his policies, and this might not sound a, a big deal for us today, but Gladstone was one of the first major politicians to recognise the importance of talking to the electorate. He liked it because it was a bit of a boost to his ego to talk to large cheering crowds, but he also realised that times were changing and that more and more people were getting the vote as a result of the Reform Acts. So during 1879, you have Gladstone doing long talks to large crowds, and one set of these became famous, in particular the Midlothian speeches that were, unsurprisingly, given the name, made in Scotland in 1879. Uh, he campaigned against Britain's fighting in the Anglo-Afghan War of the time. Just as a brief note, the British had perpetually been involved in fighting uh, the Afghans. Uh, and they, they, they were very opposed to the idea of the, the Afghans making incursions into northwest India throughout the 19th century. So they alternated uh, between uh, waging war on the Afghans and making treaties with them. And in 1879, they were waging war. Gladstone campaigned against this conflict and other colonial wars of the time, and he spoke in public about how we had, quote, no business to take these engagements when our hands were full. So, the fact that Gladstone was elected in 1879-1880 is seen by some historians as proof of the fact that at the very beginning of the period, the empire wasn't popular. Then, the conventional argument goes, the empire got more and more popular over the 1880s and 1890s. And there are a variety of ways that this popularity can be demonstrated. For instance, in the 1880s, you have the tone of newspapers changing. Uh, you have the emergence of the so-called new journalism, which used bigger fonts and shorter, catchier headlines to try and grab your attention. The papers that went along with this, such as the influential Pall Mall Gazette, published shorter articles, they were more blunt, they were more to the point in support of or a rejection of a particular view or policy. There is a direct link between these new journalism newspapers of the 1880s and the tabloids of today. And you get these blunter, snappier papers, these blunter, snappier articles becoming more explicit in their support for empire, directly linking it to patriotism suggesting that if you don't support the empire, then you're not a true Brit. These papers laid into politicians if it was felt they weren't doing enough to defend the empire and Queen Victoria's representatives abroad. And a notorious example of this is the matter of General Gordon. General Gordon had been asked by the British government to help evacuate Sudan in 1884 because the country was being overrun by the forces of the Mahdi, who was an Islamic jihadist, and who was seeking to overthrow the British and the Egyptians there. However, once Gordon got to Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, he showed no intention of leaving and instead started to reorganise the city to make it more resilient to any attack by the Mahdi. The Mahdi's men soon surrounded the city and started a siege. When the British press heard about this siege, they started to put pressure on Gladstone to do something about this to send another load of British soldiers out to rescue Gordon. But Gladstone was reluctant to get involved in another expensive war, and so he refused. But the pressure continued all throughout the year, and in the end, he relented. He sent a group of men out under the general Sir Garnet Walsley to rescue Gordon. These troops ended up getting to Khartoum two days too late. 
In January 1885, the Mahdi's men broke into the city and killed Gordon and his men. The papers went mad at Gladstone. For instance, they changed his nickname from G-O-M, which stood for Grand Old Man because he was old and felt to have a certain amount of integrity and dignity, to M-O-G, Murderer of Gordon. Gladstone resigned a few months later, in June 1885. So this can be seen as an example of the British being very pro-Empire. Another type of source that can be used to prove that imperialism was popular in the 1880s and the 1890s was the Music Hall. The Music Hall was basically an evening review. It was a, a variety of acts that performed in a variety of ways. So you had dancing, you had singing, you had comedy routines, that sort of thing. These were very, very popular in this period. They were the main sources of entertainment for the working and middle classes and lower middle classes in particular. Now today, the Music Halls have all but disappeared. Uh, most of them have been pulled down or converted, but in the 1880s there were 500 of them in London alone. Music hall shows contained a lot of plays and songs that glorified empire. You had popular writers of songs such as G.W. Hunt, who wrote songs that came to be described as jingoistic, as automatically opposed to anyone who wasn't a part of the empire. According to this traditional view, the support for empire only went up and up across our period. You have the main historian who's looked at stuff like this, uh, John Mackenzie. He argues that pro-imperial ideas were everywhere. They were in school textbooks, they were on the side of biscuit tins, they were on the no in the novels that people read, they were in the music they listened to, and so on. And the support for the British Empire is seen, as, seen by some as reaching its climax during the Boer War, with the relief of the siege of Maeve King. Maeve King had been besieged by the Boers in South Africa for 217 days, and the British inside, led by Robert Baden-Powell, who went on to found the Boy Scouts, were saved when one of Lord Robert's relief columns relieved them. There's a conventional idea that when the news of the end of the siege reached Britain in May 1900, there was a frenzy of crowds in the streets. People hugging each other with joy that, was a big, that a big blow had been struck to the Boer plans to kick the British out of South Africa. So there are just a few examples that can be used to demonstrate a growth in popular support for imperialism by 1902 compared to 1880. However, if we want to look at other points of view, there are some problems with such a straightforward approach. The first of these is the most obvious that just because you have all of these sources, it doesn't mean people actually agreed with them. Bernard Porter has made this point. He says that there were very few sources to do with empire being produced in the late 19th century, and those few sources that were produced, the British didn't necessarily agree with. Now, I think he's wrong on the first point. There were lots of sources to do with the empire at this time, but the second point still stands. Just because people read papers that said certain things doesn't mean they necessarily believed what they read. Just because people went to see music hall shows that had certain messages in them, it doesn't mean that they went along with what they heard and accepted it. It's just like today, people watching Big Brother or a show with someone opinionated on it, like Jeremy Clarkson, they can watch these things without needing to agree with the opinions expressed by the presenters or by the contestants. Now that's not to say, of course, that they automatically did reject these ideas. It's just to say that you can't automatically assume that the one leads to the other, that the presence of a product pre-assumes its acceptance. One way of assessing how far imperialism was popular is to look at what the people who opposed empire did. Even before the establishment of the British Labour Party at the turn of the century, there were some commentators, particularly on the left, who criticised empire. They felt it was the preserve of the capitalists, who sucked the resources from one place to main maintain profits, then moved on to another, gradually taking over the whole world. And one of the most prominent of the socialists before the Labour Party came along was William Morris, who established the Socialist League in 1885. He, like other socialists, was firm in his conviction that if socialist leaders worked hard, they could persuade workers to stand up for better working conditions and for a change to the domestic system generally, 
but they felt that you couldn't get workers to change their ideas about the empire so easily. As William Morris wrote in a socialist publication in 1893, quote, the truth is any approach to jingoism, however feeble, is certain to be popular with the whole mass of non-political people, i.e. about 999 out of the 1,000, who though non-political, do nevertheless vote on occasion. For Morris, the people were blinded by the glory of empire, so wrapped up in the tales of heroism and adventure that they failed to see that, as he saw it, maintaining an empire was not in the workers' best interests. 